Now, you probably learned as much about copyright in the last three hours as I know, because you took an amazing crash course. Um, but I'm just going to share some of my work experience in the trenches. I'm really not Barbara Gordon. I'm really Jamie Nathan. And I work way downstairs. And I mostly sit in my cave and answer emails from uh, our patrons who are outside of the library and have a few very brave visitors come in and ask me if they can, re if they can duplicate material. Okay, so I'm going to tell you what I don't do. Most of the time, I don't figure out who owns copyright. Okay, and that's because this is what I'm not. I'm not a detective. And figuring out who owns copyright is a very difficult process. Okay? Right now, the current law, both in Israel and in America and throughout much of Europe, is that copyright lasts 40 years, excuse me, 70 years after the death of the author if there is a human named author. Okay? If the author is uh, so is pseudonymous or anonymous or an organization, not human, then it lasts 70 years from publication. So that if you take a beautiful publication from the National Library, okay, many people helped write this and I can tell you who they were, but it says all rights reserved the National Library. So that this would be out of copyright in 70 years. No one has to die for this to be out of, out of copyright. Okay. Um, our current law is a new law that was passed in 2007 and went into effect in May of 2008. Our old law was based on the British copyright law, which was the Act of 1911. It had a number of amendments, but the basic law specified that the term of copyright was 50 years. Now this was very helpful. Now that we're stuck with 70 years, we look back and we go, oh, 50 years, that was so much easier. Um, there were amendments that extended this period at some point, um, however, it wasn't extended until the new copyright law for photographs. And do some of you work in archives? Archeonim yesh ki, that's very important for archivists, okay? <coughs> that if you have photographs that were taken prior to the new act coming into effect, prior to 2008, copyright lasted in photographs for 50 years from the taking of the photograph. That puts a lot of your photographs out of copyright. That's a good thing, okay, for making things accessible. We have the new law. <coughs> okay, that tells us if it's a human being, 70 years. Anonymous, 70 years from publication. If it's a sound recording, 50 years. If it's a government publication, 50 years from publication. Okay, my job is not to figure out who owns copyright, okay? If you're trying to do this for your patrons, your job is also not to, fig to figure out who owns copyright. You should, however, try, okay? You won't be able to do it. Why not? Why can't you figure out who owns copyright? Can anybody think of an answer? It's not written down. It's not written down. It's not written down most of the time. That's correct. We, didn't have, we don't have a copyright registry like the United States does. So it's generally, there's no registration, okay? And it doesn't need to be registered to be copyrighted. It's copyrighted the moment it is created. Why else? If Charlotte Veer's Skuyot, Bidiuk, okay? So if I wrote something, I could have transferred the rights to somebody else, and you would have no way of knowing that. You read the book, you see my name, I have licensed it, I have given it as a gift, I can do whatever I want with that right. And you, as the person who's trying to figure out who owns copyright, are, you have one hint, my name in the book. And now you have to go figure out who owns the copyright. So during my lifetime, or by my will, I transfer copyright. Now, we're talking about 70 years after I'm dead. 50 years after I'm dead, who's going to remember what I did with it? Quite frankly, people are living a lot longer these days, and I encounter quite a few people who don't know what they did with their copyright, okay? I had to, for, for a patron, find out, um, get permission from the artist 
to use his artwork. His aide answered the phone. She somehow conveyed to him what I want to do and asked him if he would give permission. I am not sure that the man was of sound mind. Okay, that's in a lifetime. What about 20 years down the line? We're on the next generation, 40 years, 60 years. I have people, I have Martin Buber's great granddaughter holding copyright. Okay, at least I know who that is. It's very hard to find somebody who owns the copyright for various reasons. Okay. So your job is to look for who owns copyright and your job is to do it good enough. That's a rule of thumb, okay? You will probably not have a definitive answer. But what does good enough mean, okay? I had an example where somebody wanted to use a poem. We had the manuscript of the poem in our archive. It had also been published by Amovet in an anthology of literature. So, I knew who the author was and I used whatever last address, last known contact, to try to contact the author and I contacted Amovet. I don't know what the agreement was, whether the poem was licensed, exclusively, non-exclusively, for a period of time, forever. I contacted, nobody answered me back from the author, but Amovet answered me back and said, we allow you to use it. Fine. Does that mean that Amovet owns the copyright? I don't know, and quite frankly, I don't know that Amovet knows. If Amovet knew that they owned the copyright, I think they would have written back, yes, and please pay us $100. I think there's a very good chance that they do not know either. But they said, okay, it's okay with us if it's okay with you, and I said, it's okay with me if it's okay with you. And that's good enough, and you will rarely know whether you got it right. But you are going to try, okay? So, here's what you're going to do. You're going to make some policy decisions within your institution. In the, at, at the library, we have a policy decision of 150 years. We will not open up anything online unless it was created 150 years ago. Where does that come from? We say, okay, we are going on the assumption that the person who created the item was at least 20 years old when he or she created it. They had to have had a mature mind and intellect in order to be able to create this. That could be a false assumption. That's our assumption. We then say we're going to add 80 years and let them live to the ripe old age of 100. That could be a false assumption. In fact, I checked today and the actuarial tables say that in Israel, the average life expectancy is 82. 80 for men, 84 for women, um, probably because we're always hot, I don't know. Um, but we say 80 years plus another 70 after you're dead, then we'll open it up. Now that's probably being conservative, however, we could have items that were written by somebody who wrote it when he was 18 and he lived to 104 and we have infringed his copyright, okay? The only way to be 100% sure is to have, we could say 180 years. We don't. We made a policy decision of 150 years and I think it's a conservative decision. You have to decide how many attempts are you going to make to find the copyright holder, okay? You can't just say, well, I don't know and give up. You're going to try. How many times are you going to try? What ways are you going to try? Are you going to look for emails? Are you going to contact, are you going to look up 144, use Bezek, okay? How many different ways are you going to send that out? Are you going to write a letter to the last known address? Are you going to call the last phone number? Document these attempts. You decide how many attempts Make sure if the letters come back unopened, you keep them. This is your proof that you tried. You set your policy for your institution. Okay, and for whatever you're using this, whether it's going up on a website or being used in your institution, make sure somewhere, I would put it on your website, um, plus somewhere maybe at your circulation desk, have something that says if you think we have violated copyright, please contact us. So that you're showing your willingness to take off whatever you may have put up that may have violated copyright. Okay, 
So if you have an item and you're fairly certain that copyright does apply, and you have tried to get permission, okay, and you have failed, are you going to let your patron copy the item? And if so, if you decide that you are, how much of it are you going to let them copy? We heard Neva asked about Shimu Shogen, okay, fair use. One of the, the reasons you may be allowed to make the copy for the patron after having made attempts to locate the owner of copyright is that it is for one of the purposes, and I'll go through what they are again, okay, it is for the purposes of fair use, and one of the weights in fair use, one of the factors is quantity, but no quantity is ever given, not by the courts and not in the law. You need to have a policy for how much you're going to copy. I heard 10% brought up by somebody, 20%, 25%. Just stick to your policy. Be consistent. And you're asking yourself, is this fair use? Fair use is going to be your ticket to make most of your copies. Okay? This is the part of the law that provides for fair use. In the law, our law is based predominantly on the U.S. law, in some places word for word, but not everywhere. I, I was at Neva's uh, lecture, but I didn't hear everything. Um, I don't recall her pointing out that the list of uses for fair use is not a closed one. So if you read it, is that kagon ele. Okay? That means it could be for other uses as well. These are not the only reasons. Okay? But such reasons as private study, research, criticism, review, journalistic reporting, quotation, instruction, and examination by an educational institution, these put you within the ability to make copies under fair use. Okay? Now, does that mean that if you're doing the copy for one of these reasons, it's okay? Not necessarily. Um, I took this off of the Time Magazine uh, website. We had a request to use something from Time Magazine. We have Time Magazine. We have Yidia Dachronot. Okay? Somebody wants to use a small part of a newspaper. I can call that fair use. However, if the newspaper is still alive and kicking, I went to Time Magazine. And this is what they have now. They have a Dropbox, and they said, what are you using it for? And I wrote a presentation. And what currency? I chose dollars. They only gave me world rights. I wanted to say in the library, but they didn't have that. Full article. And one time use, the price was $1,000. Uh, when I went onto the Time Magazine uh, website a year ago for the actual patron who wanted to use it, they had something else. They've changed the Dropbox, but it said if you wish to use any materials from our magazine in a classroom uh, for up to 30 uh, students, it is $2 per time that you use it. So that a professor or a teacher who wants to give a lecture and gives it again and gives it in more than one class, a librarian who's giving lecture, has to send them $2 every time they use it. Not asking for a copy of it, just using it in a classroom. That's Time Magazine. And you know what? Time Magazine may come after me. This is one of the risks you want to consider. Okay? Is this a no longer relevant, no longer existing, pre-war Germany uh, newspaper, unlikely they're going to come after you. Time Magazine, different set of... Uh, are you talking about using an article online that sending I'm not necessarily talking about using it online, and that was not for them sending me. That was just to give me permission to use it. It said, it said in fact, if you do not have a copy of the article you, you are using, you may copy and paste the content. They're assuming you have a copy. This is not even to provide the copy. This is just to say, hey, I'm using it. And it doesn't necessarily mean online. It could mean right here. It could mean in a handout. And it could be just one article or just one page. It's Time Magazine. I'm not messing with them. Why did they come after you? 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 I would certainly make that argument. But that's an argument. Anybody can sue anybody. I could sue you. Uh, right, and you could sue me for not smiling. Okay, then you have to fight it off. Okay. 
היא אמרה בפירוש שהאדם לא יכול לקבוע משהו שהוא בניגוד לחוק, בהמשך למה שהייתי שאלה. בדיוק, אבל שימוש הוגן זה אקספשן, זה אקספשן לקופירייט, זה לא אומר שהדבר הזה לא קופירייט, אבל אתה אומר שבתוך משהו קופירייט, זה יהיה טוב, ואתה תהיה מוכן לתת את התאסף, 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 ואתה תהיה The first one is the purpose and character of the use. So I'm saying, I'm giving a presentation. I'm making a Purim costume. I think this is not problematic because of the purpose and character of the use I'm making of this. Okay? Next is the character of the work that I'm using. What am I using? If I am using something, a painting, and the whole painting, I'm using... It, it shows what it is. It's, I'm not using part of it. I'm, not, I'm using the entire thing. That would, might be viewed differently because the painting is a standalone item as opposed to a book which has various parts which can be taken apart. Okay, and the next two are the scope of the use, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Quantitatively, we can say percentage. Qualitatively, we talk about liba. Piskedin talk about was this the liba? So if I were, for instance, um, making a copy of Martin Luther King's uh, speech, and I, you only wanted the part where it says I have a dream, I might say no, that's the liba. But I'll give you the the third to fourth line, okay? I'll find that would be okay for me under fair use, but not giving you a photocopy of the first uh, sentence. <laughs> No, and the question is, what are you doing with it? But am I making a copy, if I have that manuscript, and we have numerous manuscripts, okay, is, I, I'm giving you a copy of that very thing. I'm not saying you can't use those words, and Neva did address that. You can use the words in a different way, okay? You can have the idea of, I had a dream, and use it um, in your own speech. Okay, and you might be going on with a different dream, and that would be called a transformative work. As again, I think this is a transformative work of the Batman logo. I've made something different from it. It's not on the Batman comic. I didn't use a picture of the Batman comic. Okay, so we want to apply the four fair use factors. That's what you have to do. And no one is going to be able to tell you whether you're right or wrong. You're simply sitting there and going, on a case-by-case -case basis, this works here, this doesn't work here. Um, Cornell had a very simple chart, so I put that up. There are a number of things like this that you can find on the internet. They ask, okay, on the top, is it in the public domain? Is it owned by the faculty? This is for, of course, an academic institution. Was it created by the university, etc.? If yes, no copyright issues. If no, unknown. <coughs> You seek advice from their legal counselor. That is good uh, thumbnail, the rule of thumb advice for you. Have legal counsel, whether it's internal or external. If you're not sure, you should have a professional to ask, okay? Try to determine if it's fair use. You're doing that, four factors. Secure permission. Find the person that you were having such a hard time finding because maybe they'll give you permission. Do try, always try, okay? Or, I'm not gonna use that one, I'm gonna use another one. What else is similar? I give up here, find something else. Okay, interlibrary loan. That's where I work, I work in the internet library loan department even though I do permissions and copyright work for the entire library. This is the most frequently encountered case that we have making copies for your patrons, okay? Obtaining <coughs> articles and books from other libraries. Many of them today are digital. This is a problem, okay? So, um, what do you do when you need to get a, a, an item from another library? There is a special section in the law for obtaining items from another library. Okay, are we here? Okay, you are allowed to make a copy if you are a library or an archive for a number of reasons, okay? 
the first, the first thing that we say is you can make a copy for somebody if they could make that copy. And Neva touched on this. Somebody's outside the library. They can't come into the library to make it. You have to find out from them, would they have been able to make it? So you're making a determination on their fair use. Now, I don't know how much you want to go into that. I don't like to make determinations for what somebody else is going to do. But if they will sign a declaration that it is only for private study, and they are not going to do anything, not, not going to transfer it digitally, and they limit themselves in various ways, your policy may be that given those parameters, you're willing to provide the, the item for the patron. Okay, what you can't do is systematic copying. You can't be copying and copying and copying so that the person basically is avoiding buying a subscription to Time Magazine or avoiding buying a book. Okay, they order chapter one, then they order chapter two, then they order chapter three. You have to, hmm, I'm smarter than that. I'm not making a copy of chapter four even though it's only 10%. Okay, you have to be a thinking being when you're doing this work. Okay, now, there are a couple of ways you can make copies for, for digital um, articles. One is based on what's called CONTU, which is the Commission on New Technological Uses of Copyrighted Works, which was established in 1974, and they basically put out guidelines that allowed libraries to make <coughs> copies of digitalized articles. Okay, and the rule is called the rule of five because five keeps coming up. This is when you're downloading from a database. Okay, you're allowed to, for another institution, download five articles in one year from a journal. You need to keep count of this. I keep an Excel spreadsheet. I get a request for an article from People Magazine, from Time, from Journal of Psychology. I make that. Ooh, they say, the, the National Library of Israel will make those copies. Great, I get a second and a third and a fourth request. It happens all the time. After five, goodbye. Five articles from one journal and then also from another journal. Yes. Okay, but you also have the Mabat Al. You don't want to be doing systematic copying. So if the same person is asking again and again and again, you, you, know, you have to be smarter than that because there, a case could be made against you. Well, yes, Kantu said you can do this, but hello, were you awake when they asked for their 25th series? Yes, okay? It applies only to articles from the last five years, and you should all look up Kantu, and you should all, I have, you need to have your warrior uh, tools, okay? Your fighting tools, you need to have the Kantu guidelines, the laws, they all have to be at your fingertips. I like to keep them printed out so I can refer to them, okay? I have Kantu right here. I did not. I believe that my use is fair use. And keep a record. Okay, here is one of the links for Contu guidelines. I assume these the presentations we put made available for everybody. Yes. It only applies, this only applies for the last five years. They, are, they want us to be able to disseminate journals that have been published, journal articles that have been published in the last five years, not journal articles from 20 years ago. Yes, there, it does not exist. These guidelines do not exist for journals. We keep what was available yesterday in that five year period is now out and a new guy is in. That's right. This is for the dissemination of new materials. Look. <laughs> that goes out. It's like your points on a license. Okay, that one goes out after, for instance, if I supplied five copies this year of time, at the end of the year, okay, if that was from five years ago, it's out, and I have a new year, and I can supply five new ones. Wonderful. Right. Check your database agreements. Fantastic. Exactly. So Kantu is just, it's a way out without having to check anything. But you should know your database agreements. I know my database agreements. Okay? Somebody in your institution needs to gather together your database agreements. 
and give them to somebody to be in charge of. And if you can't find them, because sometimes you can't find them, or sometimes you didn't sign a specific one, there you went with the general terms of use. Look on the website. They all have terms of use on the website. So the default is the terms of use. The default is this, is this your contract? If you don't have a, right. If you don't have a contract, there are terms of use on the website. So you can look on all of these websites and some will say right away, we allow interlibrary loan, and some will not mention it. If you work for an academic institution, you are in a much better situation because you have all of the uh, contracts that I've read say authorized user. You have a very specific definition of authorized <coughs> user. You have people who are paying tuition or are on your faculty as opposed to having walk-in users. I can't say that that you are fine, that is perfect. I don't know how your, how each of, how your suppliers will view that. Okay, if you start supplying to us, we're not, we, okay, we're not one of your students, so you can't do that. Now let's say a student started downloading hundreds. Taylor and Francis might notice that. They keep count. They, in, the, um, in your contract, you might notice that it will say, not only does it have to be an authorized user, but it's limited to 25 articles from each journal per year. Okay, but well, some of them do. So. Whereas not everybody allows interlibrary loan. That's right. Authorized users is something. But the interlibrary loan, some of the of both suppliers and many others will not allow you to some that's right. Some won't allow it, some don't mention it. We turned to EBSCO and got a wonderful letter from them. We asked them at one bumped into them at one of the uh, uh, the conferences in the world that and and shumi bala al ayat al shulchomarim itel chamagarim. Lovely. Okay, I have it in writing from them. So if you don't have it defined, ask. Maybe they will send you a letter that says, "Of course we allow that." Okay, in libraries and archives, you can make your own copy for reserve. You can scan things for reserve. In, okay, in any format. So you can take your old items. Scan them without any problem as long as you're a library or an archive. These are some useful websites just to give you some lengths of um, copyright in various uh, countries because we have many items that originated in other countries. Okay, this is a very cute little open up foreign copyright laws. Um, Rules of thumb or codes of best practice. <coughs> These are some very good ones. Stanford has a very good one. Uh, the Association of Research Libraries has a very good one. Columbia University has a very good one that I didn't put on here. Uh, this is one that's in Hebrew, the Farm Haskalah Nigisha from Haifa University, where Neva works. It's an excellent set of codes of best practice in Hebrew. Okay, and the last thing I just want to mention is that we all need to put up signs. That's a recommendation. It's not the law. It is the law in America. So if you're wondering whether you should or whether you shouldn't, you don't have to. We don't have a law that says it, but America does. It says it in Section 108, which relates to um, what is permissible by libraries and archives in America. They, it dictates the actual language. It doesn't even just say you have to put up a sign. It says the sign has to say this. Okay? It has to be displayed prominently at the place where orders are accepted, and it has to be on a note, notice form. Here is a suggested notice for signs where people can do non-supervised copying. This is only in libraries and archives. And the language for what you have to have in America. It's a good basis for taking from if you're going to put up your own sign, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It tells you that it has to be on heavy paper or an 18 point font. It's very specific. You can do less, but it gives you a starting place. Okay, the last one, notices on forms, that's it.
I wish you much luck. I'm happy to answer questions for you. I'm keeping the cape on. Do you want to